Hey you guys, it's Katie and Elisha from the blog and podcast, now that we're a family.com. And today we get to talk to you guys about why our children sit with us in church. We get asked this question a lot. And before you get too excited, this is not going to be like a doctrinal dissertation or something on the subject. This is going to be specifically why our children sit with us in church. And hopefully it stirs up some conversation amongst you and your spouse or your kids. Katie and I both grew up sitting with our family in church, and so it was the most natural feeling thing for us to do when we had children and when we were going to church. And so even though this has become, I would say, a conviction in our home for our children to sit with us, it really came from a place of it just being kind of a preference or being what we were most comfortable with. And it is so interesting how oftentimes those preferences find a way of making it to the conviction category, you know, if you want it to bad enough. Now I'm teasing, uh, but Katie and I both grew up sitting with our families in church. We loved it. We had really fond memories of doing that. And so when we started having kiddos, it was, it made the most sense to us to sit with our children in, in church. I enjoyed the process. I liked having my kids on, on my lap. I liked singing songs with them. And so we just preferred it that way. Yeah, and then we started having two children and then three children, and now all the children are two and a half and under. And I went to Elisha and was like, why don't we drop off a couple of these guys in the nursery? Like, they're really noisy, or I have to take them out, at least two of them out, for a large portion of the service. Leon was the only one, the two and a half year old, that was sitting in the service, the majority the majority of the time he stayed with you but i was kind of in and out or elisha was in and out with the younger kids and so we really started to reevaluate okay is this actually a preference now or is this a conviction because if it's just a preference then let's bring them to the nursery they started to have other little toddler friends that were going to the nursery and we had to start solidifying what we were going to do going forward yeah and it was really good to be able to have that conversation in real time because we hadn't been faced with I guess that dilemma up until that point. But here we were trying to discover whether or not this was a conviction or whether or not it was a preference. And it's funny because I would say between the time that it was a preference to conviction, when we were still kind of up in the air on how we felt about that, it was more of a safety issue that kept our kids with us in service. Uh, we didn't know everybody that was volunteering back in the children's program. We didn't know who the other kids were. We didn't know if they had smartphones. We didn't know what their parents, who their parents were, you know, what they were going to be talking about. And we've just heard way too many stories about really bad things happening to children in children's ministries. Yeah, unfortunately, the part of growing up in Christian communities, like Elisha and I did, is that I'm phrasing this sentence really weird, <laughs> but because we grew up in Christian communities, you're very aware, I feel like we are very wary that Christian circles are great places for people who have the wrong motives to hide out. Because it's very easy for them to put on a smile, hang out in church. For some reason, people just check out when they're at church. Parents are just like, take my kid. You're a church volunteer. You must be great. You must be background checked. You must love the Lord and love my child. And that's just not the case. And, and we all know that, unfortunately, when you've grown up in the church. And so it's just not a safe place for our kids necessarily as much as we love our church and love the people working there um, it's just not something we're willing to sign off on when our kids are really little um, in that toddler stage and they're able to communicate what's happening to them and then when they're older like our six-year-old and five-year-old now it's more the influences of the other children on them we aren't confident in those interactions um, even if they're able to communicate what's going on with adults at that point 
Yeah, so that was a couple year period for us where we went from it being a preference to it becoming kind of inconvenient, but then realizing, man, we don't fully know everybody that's back there volunteering. Our kids are really young. They don't have the capability of communicating to us what's going on back there. So let's keep them with us for the sake of safety. But over that time, it's become a conviction now. We've got five children, we sit with them. And I do wanna say, even in that time when it was an inconvenience, it was still a joy. You know, it was yeah. never not been a joy. The inconvenience is when you're standing up in the middle of the service and having to you step out of the step out of the service, keep your kid quiet because you don't want to be a distraction to uh, other people in, in the service. That's a little bit of an inconvenience, but still the pros heavily outweighed the cons, even from a personal experience standpoint. I loved and still do love sitting with my toddlers in the service. And it's funny because I, I am blessed to be able to spend most evenings with my family, a lot of mornings as well we get to spend together as a family. And yet when Sunday rolls around, I realize how little time I've spent with some of the toddlers in in our family, you know, where I'm like, boy, I get to sit with you for an hour and a half. This can be a really fun bonding time. And so I cherish it. And now that I've got kids that have grown beyond that toddler stage, I really look back on those years with them with fond memories and it makes me cherish those moments that I have now with my toddlers, with my youngsters. And so even though it was an inconvenience, we still loved it. And it was still our, I'd say it was still a preference, honestly, throughout it's, that time frame. It's always been a very special thing for us to worship together as a family. And it's way worth the inconvenience that it causes to be able to hear our little kids sing and to be able to sit next to them or snuggle with them and uh, worship the Lord together and learn about the Lord together. It's, it's always way worth it. Yeah. So. so as Katie already said in the beginning, we're not prepared or equipped to give some doctrinal statement and justification for why we now sit with our children in church and why they sit with us. But some of the reasons that we find it being advantageous to have our children with us is that we view them, one, we view them as being a part of the church. And when we think of the Sunday gathering, we think of, man, the actual body is coming together corporately to worship our Lord and Savior. And oftentimes, I think I used to approach it as a very, approach it like a consumer. Approach it like, well, what am I getting out of this? What did I get out of the service? You know, or what did I get out of worship? Did I enjoy that? What was my experience? Instead of asking, what is it? What, what is it that we're going to? And the more I've asked that question, the more I've been compelled to bring my children into that experience. Because if you're going to Sunday saying, well, I've got to get something out of the serv out of the sermon, and if my kids aren't getting anything out of it, then why are they in here? Or if they're not, a if they're being a distraction to other people while they're worshiping, then I better get them out of here. And all those things are kind of silly to think about once you actually start asking the question, what is it that we're coming here to do? And I mean, you know, obviously Jesus himself as an advocate of children, you know, he he really furrowed his brow towards people that uh, push children away for to do more serious work. And so I think we should take that approach into, man, if we are going to worship the Lord, we can't do it with our children. What does that say about our view of God, about the Sunday gathering and what we're exemplifying to our children? Yeah, I think I always grew up thinking that those verses in Matthew, when Jesus says, hey, let the little children come to me, it was, the disciples pushing the children away. But it's like, this was a corporate gathering. This was where a lot of people were coming together and they wanted it to be quiet and orderly and listen, um, be able to listen to the message that Jesus was sharing. This was very important. And this was the rare period of time when Jesus was actually there on earth. And he still wanted the children in that meeting. And so I think we see the the Lord's heart towards not only having the children there, but having the full families together and intact. And that's something that Elisha and I just really feel strongly about in the New Testament and the Old Testament. You see families together and the power of that family unit doing things is it's super powerful. It's super special. There's nothing else like it. Yeah. Like you said, the concept of separating the children and the adults and the senior citizens and, and the youth group, it, you can't find that example in the Bible. And it's, you know, illustrated even in the epistles that Paul writes when he's writing to the local churches there, he's, he addresses the children, right? He, he's assuming they're there with them in the gathering he says, Hey children, obey your parents. You know, and then he's talking to the men, he's talking to the women. There isn't this assumption that everybody's going to be off in their own room, learning something curated to their age group or to what people would say their, their ability to grasp the concepts are. So I do think that the illustration and the example that we're given in the Bible is for holistic families being together, worshiping. And again, 
we treat our kids like Christians six days a week. So I don't know why on the Lord's day, we would all of a sudden treat them like they're not a part of the church, like they're not Christians. Yeah, so I think something else that we really love is that this sets up the structure for just the, through the rest of the week, right? It's setting up the, it's not like, okay, our Sunday school teachers are who teach us spiritually at the beginning of the week and the pastor teaches mommy and daddy spiritually at the beginning of the week and then we go about our business. We are worshiping together as a family, we're learning together as a family, and it just helps uh, reinforce that biblical structure of biblical leadership that God intended to be in place. There's a fly that's driving Elisha crazy right now. Sorry. Um, and that is that parents are supposed to be the spiritual shepherds of their children. The father first, and then the mother and the children. And the children are able to see that when you're all worshiping together. And they aren't off isolated being taught by someone totally different that's seen as the expert in this, in this category. Our culture, all of Western culture, has done such a effective job of segregating age groups and separating the family on every level possible and grades and sports based off of your gender, your interests, your hobbies. And if we adopt that attitude into church, then we're just going to have disintegrated families. That's not at all what the Bible speaks to when it comes to families. There is family integration in like everything when you, when you look at the Bible. And it's going to be inevitable that our kids are going to have to separate in some things in life, like I already mentioned, for academics or maybe if they play particular sports. So if we've got the opportunity to be together as a family, we should really take that. And this is the most important thing that we can do as Christians and as parents, and that is worship together, learn about the Lord together, hear his word exposited. And Katie talked about what this is really showing to our family. It's setting this standard and this expectation that we are all Christians. We are learning and being discipled. Um, first and foremost, you know, we're under Christ and who he is, and we're living in the reality of what he's accomplished. And then we get to sit under elders and we get to sit under our pastor's shepherding. And then the father is then shepherding his children in his own household. And if we're just dividing there in the church, that's not what's articulated and that's not what's communicated to the children. And so I just think it's such an awesome opportunity. We're not being forced to separate. If we've got the opportunity to be together, then let's take advantage of that opportunity because it's, there's going to come times and seasons where we can't be together. So I just want to take advantage of every opportunity to be together. Yeah. I also feel like this just reinforces to me that our spiritual growth happens mainly at home and we're able to come together and hear teaching of the word and worship with other saints and it's beautiful to come together for that gathering of corporate worship but the teaching and the learning of our relationships with christ come it, when we're at home you know when i'm studying the scripture when elisha's studying the scripture when we're doing family bible times and i feel like it puts a lot more responsibility on us as parents knowing our children are with us there in the service it's harder for me and i feel like for you two to just check a box and be like well our kids got their spiritual input for the week we know that these things weren't taught at their age level and they're going to pick some stuff up here or there but it's primarily on our shoulders to be able to go home and disciple our children monday tuesday wednesday thursday friday and then they're we're able to come all together and worship as a body on sunday uh, but that's not happening in a classroom again in isolation yeah it is i still think it's so interesting when people say well i have a hard time focusing on the sermon when i'm wrestling my toddler or i get distracted you know during the singing time and again that is a special time when you're together with the saints growing in your faith and worshiping together but when i just take that one example of not getting much from the sermon it's like boy most churches today have that sermon available like an hour after that goes live right you could i'm pretty sure that your church has it available to listen to like on your way home probably after church or the next day on your way to work and the point that i'm saying is is that if it's just about the teaching then yeah you you've got to focus up but clearly it's more than just the teaching what you're actually there doing is something greater than each one of the isolated activities that you do um, as a church body and there are so many resources now that we can continually be learning from throughout the week and so I, th I think of that often when, when I have to step out with one of my toddlers. I'm not like, oh, this, all my spiritual nourishment, my opportunity for it is being lost because I'm stepping out, you know, to take my kiddo to the bathroom or to quiet them down, to not, to not disrupt them. It's like, well, no, of course not. This is, this, I was there with the body. We are worshiping corporately and spiritual nourishment and, 
and learning from the scriptures and from other teachers, that happens. That can happen all the time. That can happen every day of the week. Well, yeah, if it was just about how good the sermon was and how focused we were, then we wouldn't even have to go to church in the beginning. Yes. Because we could just listen on a podcast to some of the best pastors and speakers out there, best theologians out there. Yes. So that's not what the the local gathering is all about. Yes. And so anyways, we do have a video that we linked. We'll have it linked down below. We did this a while ago, and that's, I think, where we got a lot of the questions, like, why why would you have your kids sit in church? Um, it's about how we practically do that, because we do have a lot of little kiddos. So if you're like, how would we even start to do that? Then there's a link down below, and it is something that you get better at, and it's something that can become very enjoyable and meaningful. And it really is fun to just even you know afterwards talk through uh, what the kids heard in the service or listen to what songs they knew already or listen to um, verses that they memorized that they noticed in the sermon it's it's a really special time and we're all on the same wavelength yeah and again just in conclusion we have got such a golden opportunity as parents to start determining and establishing the appetite of our children I want my kids to be able to see me worshiping corporately with other saints. I want them to see me raise my hand in praise to my heavenly father. I want them to see me opening the Bible when the pastor's expositing the scripture. And again, we we have zero judgment in our heart towards anybody that sends their kids to, to children's yeah. church. Like most of our friends do that. Most of the people that we know do that. But when I look at this opportunity that we have, I'm thinking, boy, I don't want to miss this opportunity to be able to sit with them. And yes, will there be questions that they have about the sermon and things they don't get? Of course. I do every Sunday have questions and there's things that I don't get. Like if you're looking around your congregation around the sanctuary, there are countless people that are missing things in the ser sermon. Trust me, I, I know I'm one of those people. And so to think that you should only be in the sanctuary if you're grasping everything that's being taught is kind of a silly perspective. And when I contrast that to maybe the, um, you know, vegetal theology that they might be getting in children's church, I'm thinking I'd rather have these conversations with my kids in the car on the way home. Whoa, you yeah, threw, snuck that it in in there. There. threw that in there. Snuck it in there. That is something that I did write down, but I do feel like Sunday school, not all Sunday schools are the same. I went to Sunday school a couple times growing up, I think like twice. Um, but I do think that they can kind of um, make the Bible more fantastical or like, you know, we have Disney stories and then we have Bible stories. And yeah. it's like, no, this is the Bible is history. The Bible is the living word of God. And I don't blame teachers for dumbing it down I should say to kids levels because that's what we think we need to do with coloring pages and games and cheesy movies but I think that God's word and these these true events that happen in the Bible should be treated with reverence and that's something that happens in the main service that doesn't very often happen in a Sunday school environment so I do kind of like to keep our kids out of all the fluff and puff too <laughs> Side point. Okay, so is that our ending? Yeah, let's end it with that. Okay. No more Veggie Tales theology. <laughs> Thank you all so much for listening and for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up, like, subscribe, maybe even share this video on if you have any social media platforms because we love seeing new people. We love hearing from new people. We love hearing from you. We'll see you guys next week. Farewell. Men, the Growth Initiative is now open for enrollment. The Growth Initiative is a six-week live coaching program for men that are looking to grow in areas of parenthood, in areas of provision, in areas of health, in areas of financial freedom and well-being, really in areas of life that matter most to you. When I look at my life and I think of my faith, my marriage, my, my parenting, my physical health, my financial growth and, and ability to provide for my family, I know that in order to see growth in those areas, I've got to have a systematic approach to it. So when I look at my ideals and my dreams, those are only good to me if I'm able to break down an actionable plan that I can then execute. And that's what the growth initiative is all about. Customizing your actionable plan to see growth in the areas of life that matter most to you. So if you're a Christian man and you're a husband and you're a father and you want to grow in those areas of life that I already referred to, hop on over. I'll link it below and you'll be able to find a timeline that works for you. Like I said, this is a live coaching program 
is six weeks long with live calls each week, along with tools and resources to help you up your game in those areas that matter most to you. And you can enroll in whatever time session, whatever time session, whatever session works for you time-wise. 